This is the new Nissan Aria. It's Nissan's brand new fully electric SUV. And today we're gonna to be driving it for the very first time. So stay with us and I'll be telling you what this car is like on the road, what it's like inside, but also answering some important questions including how fast it is and how far you can expect to get on a charge. But before that, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. We've got some really exciting new car reviews and group tests coming up over the next few weeks. And if you switch on notifications, we can let you know as soon as they go live. Also remember that if you want to buy any new Nissan, well, any car at all actually, whatcar.com is the place to get a great deal. So head over there or Google what car deals to find out how much you could save. As surprising as it might seem, the Aria is only Nissan's second ever proper electric car. Unless you count the EMV200 Combi, of course, which was pretty much a van with windows. Why such a surprise? Well, because Nissan effectively reinvented the electric car back in 2011 when it launched the Leaf. There were EVs before that, of course, but they were mostly quirky quadricycles like the G-Wiz. Tesla did exist, but its only model, called the Roadster, was essentially a Lotus Elise stuffed full of batteries. Now, we've done a full walk around video on this car already, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about the design. If you want to find out all about the styling, just click the link up there at the top of the screen and you can watch that video. But there are a few things I just want to mention quickly. So, as I've said, it's an SUV. Nissan describes it as a coupe crossover because it has that swooping roof line at the back there. And it's quite a big car as well. It's about 4.6 meters long and 1.6 meters tall. So about the same size as a Tesla Model Y and noticeably bigger than a Qashqai when you stood next to it. It also has this upright black grille that we haven't seen before. It looks quite futuristic, doesn't it? But it is still fairly obviously a Nissan because it's got this V shape here and these boomerang daytime running lights like you see on the Qashqai. It really just looks like a next generation Nissan because that's exactly what it is. Prices start at around £42,000, so the Aria is more expensive than an equivalent Skoda Enyaq, but does undercut the Tesla Model Y. Other rivals include the lower riding Kia EV6 and the coupe-esque Volvo C40. Today we're driving a late prototype of the smaller 63 kilowatt hour battery version of the Aria, which has an official range of up to 251 miles. If you need to go further than that, there's an 87 kilowatt hour battery, and that boosts official range to around 320 miles. The exact figure has yet to be confirmed. The bigger battery version starts at just over 51,000. Now, one slightly annoying thing about the Leaf and a lot of other electric cars from Japan, actually, is that they use one of these, a Chadamo connector for rapid charging. Nothing inherently wrong with it, it's just that electric cars from pretty much anywhere else in the world use one of these, a CCS connector. And obviously having different types of charging connector for different types of car isn't ideal because it means you have to hunt out the one you want before you can top up. And the fact is that there are more CCS charging locations in the UK, so it's a good thing that the Aria has moved over to this type of connector. Another bonus of CCS is because of the design of the socket, you can actually plug a Type 2 cable into the top here, which is what you'll be using if you charge your Aria at home. The Chadimo is a completely different type of design, so it means you have to have two sockets on the car, whereas with the CCS, you only need the one. How much power the Aria can take is a little disappointing though. It can only accept a maximum of 130 kilowatts, which means the 63 kilowatt hour version takes just over half an hour to charge from 10 to 80% in ideal conditions. Go for the larger 87 kilowatt hour battery and that time increases to around 35 minutes. Not terrible, about the same as an Audi Q4, but when you consider that cars like the EV6, Hyundai Ioniq 5 and Tesla Model Y can all accept well over 200 kilowatts, that's not exactly brilliant. Plug in at home using a regular 7 kilowatt wall box and a full 0 to 100% charge will take around 10 hours with the 63 kilowatt hour battery and 14 hours with the 87 kilowatt hour version. Now, one of the main criticisms we've had of Nissan's other electric car, the Leaf, is that it feels a bit cheap inside, even compared to similarly priced rivals. Of course, you would expect an SUV with a price tag of more than £40,000 to feel more upmarket inside, but this is properly premium. This isn't even a top spec model, it's a mid-rung Evolve trim. So you've got some really nice materials in here, you've got this wood effect on the face of the dashboard and this faux suede just above it. The seats are also part faux suede and part faux leather, if all that fake stuff sounds 
a bit cheap. It really doesn't feel it. The only thing you might want to consider is that there is no fully vegan option because the wheel in all versions of the Aria is made of genuine leather. A couple of other interesting things. So the air conditioning is not controlled using traditional physical dials, but there is a separate panel down here. Now it's actually part of the dashboard, but the lights illuminate through it. And when you adjust the temperature or turn it off and on or switch to auto mode, you get some haptic feedback. So you know you're pressing the right area of the dashboard. So that looks really cool. It's a little bit more fiddly than it would be if you just had a big dial here, but certainly much better than putting all the controls in the touchscreen like some rivals do. If you press this little button here, then you'll notice a tray comes out of the dashboard. Nissan says that can be used for charging an iPad or even as a mobile office, you can put a little laptop up here where you're parked up and waiting for the car to charge. And also the sense console moves electrically as well. You just push a button and you can set it up ideally for your driving position. The area gets Nissan's new infotainment system as well. So there are two 12.3 inch screens. One is directly behind the steering wheel here and there's a touch screen in the middle of the dashboard here. It's perhaps not perfect in terms of definition. The graphics are a little bit fuzzy, but importantly, it does respond quickly when you swipe and press icons. And it is a big improvement over the system that you get in other Nissan models, including the Qashqai. All versions come with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, with the more expensive versions getting a 10-speaker Bose sound system as well. Storage space, pretty good. You've got a wireless phone charging port under the armrest here couple of cup holders just in front of it as well as that tray that can be used for storage that I showed you earlier there is a separate glove box here and the door bins are a reasonable size as well they're perfect for a bottle of water so overall really really nice in here but let's have a look in the back and it's not too bad actually certainly when it comes to legroom I'm just over six foot this seat in front is set up for my driving position and look absolutely loads of knee room and foot space isn't too bad either I can just about squeeze my feet under the seat in front. What's not quite so brilliant is headroom. As you can probably see, my head is not too far away from the roof lining there. Whether that's because this car is a coupe SUV, as I've already said, which has quite a swooping roof line, or because this particular car has an optional panoramic sunroof that can quite often lower the height of the ceiling a little bit, I'm not sure, but it's not too bad. And I could sit here quite comfortably for a long journey. Another bonus is that there's no transmission tunnel on the floor. The floor is completely flat here. So it means you can fit three people in the back pretty easily without the person in the center straddling a tunnel. This center console does need to be moved as far forward as it will go. Otherwise it encroaches into the rear seat area a bit. And it's also a bit of a shame that the rear seats don't do anything clever like sliding as they do in some rivals. But overall, not too bad at all. The Aria's boot isn't huge, a fair bit smaller than a Skoda Enyax. And if you go for a four wheel drive E-Force model, it becomes smaller still. There's enough space for a big shop or a short family holiday though. And you can always fold down the rear seats when you need to carry more. The Aria doesn't have a front boot or frunk, but there is enough space under the main boot floor for the charging cables. So the first thing we're gonna do is find out how efficient the area is. Now remember this is a prototype but it should give us some idea of the miles per kilowatt hour and therefore the range that this car is capable of. It's reasonably cold today, it's around about seven degrees, quite sunny and we're going to drive our usual route at Millbrook which involves a mix of simulated town, motorway and country road driving. Now as I said earlier we're driving the entry level 63 kilowatt hour battery version of the area today. There is a bigger battery version, and also there are a couple of four-wheel drive models. This is front-wheel drive. The four-wheel drive version is called the E-Force and the E-Force Performance, the performance being a quick one, of course, and that can do 0-60 in around about five seconds. But even this entry-level model, performance is absolutely fine. I mean, it's not specially quick by electric car standards. It can do 0-60 in around seven and a half seconds, but that's way quicker than a cash car or most petrol or diesel alternatives. And really, for the type of buyer this car is aimed at, it's absolutely fine. It's also a really easy car to drive smoothly. I particularly like the brakes, actually. In some electric cars, they can be grabby and it makes it difficult to slow down smoothly. Whereas here, they're very progressive and it's very easy to judge how much pressure you need to apply to slow down smoothly. 
One thing that's not quite so great though is the ride. Now this car has optional 20 inch alloys and as I've stressed a couple of times already, it is a prototype, not the finished car, but things are quite choppy, particularly at low speeds. So if you can see the camera shaking around a bit, I'm also being thrown around in my seat from side to side a bit. Now electric cars on the whole don't ride as well as petrol or diesel alternative because they've got a really heavy battery and that puts a lot of strain on the suspension. But this certainly doesn't seem to be as comfortable as cars like the Skoda Enyaq and the Hyundai Ioniq 5. The handling is absolutely fine though. This isn't a particularly sporty car, it's not designed to be, but there's enough positivity, enough precision to the steering to give you confidence along quite twisty roads like this, not too much body lean either. But also the steering is quite light at low speed, so it makes the area easy to maneuver. So certainly on that front, no complaints at all. Now we're on the simulated motorway section of Millbrook Proving Ground at the moment. We call it the high speed bowl. And I can tell you the ride has certainly improved. It's not as choppy as it is at low speeds, although I am still being jostled around in my seat a little bit more than I would be in some rivals. I'm doing 70 miles an hour at the moment. There's a little bit of wind noise from around the door mirrors, but not much road noise. So it does seem that this is a pretty quiet cruiser by the standards of the class. So that is a good thing. Now we're just finishing up our efficiency test at the moment and the trip computer says the Ariat has averaged 2.7 miles per kilowatt hour. That gives a theoretical range of about 170 miles on a charge, so not particularly great. But there are some fairly hilly sections of this test route, even though we've been driving gently. And it is quite cold today, which isn't great for battery performance. So you should be able to expect around 200 miles, particularly if you go for the smaller alloy wheels that this car is available with. If you go for 20s, they knock around about 20 miles off the official range. There's certainly plenty to like about the new Aria, particularly its interior and its drivability. A year ago, it would undoubtedly have been one of the best cars in the class. Over the past 12 months though, cars like the Enyaq and EV6 have really moved the game on, and the Aria doesn't seem to have enough outstanding qualities or a low enough price to really challenge those rivals. But remember, so far we have only had a short drive of a prototype of the Aria on big wheels. A final verdict will need to wait until we've tested the full production model later in the spring. Thanks for watching, and if you've enjoyed this video, we'd really appreciate it if you could give it a like and hit subscribe. And if you've got any questions about the Nissan Aria, just leave us a comment below. Other than that, we'll see you next time.